All right, back for another live stream show after taking a few days off from making YouTube videos, although I did write four articles from my Patreon account contributors, my over a thousand Patreon account contributors for only five bucks a month. You can take a look behind the paywall and find content that I'm pretty sure you will not find anywhere else from some of the best analysts. They don't have the information that I have because I am a research ninja. I am willing to go into things like the Fed, like the Fed's May 2020 financial stability report and look through the documents and pull out the footnotes and find them to benefit everyone. So this is linked in with some of the stuff behind articles behind the paywall about that. Today at 4.30 p.m., the Federal Reserve made another weird announcement. There was a 4.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, excuse me. The Federal Reserve <laughs> announced the results of a bank stress test. And they announced that they want to cap dividends and they're going to forbid share buybacks in stress tests. But I, what I think this really hints at, and this connects with the Fed's May 2020 financial stability report, and if you want to, you can go read it yourself. If you are a patron account contributor, I would recommend reading that article at least once. If you don't want to pay, you can go and read the financial stability report yourself. But the stuff in there, it's setting up. It is looking ugly. We are setting up for a enormous commercial real estate bust in the coming months. I don't know if it's one month, two months, six months, maybe a year. There's experts out there like Christopher Whalen, who is a bank and mortgage finance industry and real estate expert. He did predict the housing bubble a couple years in advance prior to 2008. And he thinks that it could it could uh, go maybe into part of 2021, that it could be delayed out a little, a little bit. So there is a commercial real estate problem and a residential real estate problem. And I'm going to respectfully disagree with Lynn Alden and George Gammon about this because Lynn Alden has said that the banks are okay. The banks do have reserves. However, there are a lot of red flags, especially with HSBC Bank. Kyle Bass, hedge fund manager Kyle Bass, has been warning about HSBC Bank for over a year in his tweets and other interviews. And guess what? The people in the mainstream financial media have intentionally, when he's brought up problems in HSBC Bank on his Twitter and also in interviews on Yahoo Finance and CNBC and elsewhere, these guys just ignored everything he said. He was warning people George Gammon was doing videos about this. I was doing videos about this, about problems with HSBC Bank. Well, recently there's more articles coming out about HSBC Bank and then a new article that came out in the last couple weeks about Wells Fargo. And we'll get into that in a little bit. But first, the bank reserve. So the claim is that the banks have plenty of reserves. So they do have a substantial amount. However, in the last month or so, I'm on the St. Louis Fed's website and it has declined substantially. So on the St. Louis Fed website, under liabilities and capital, other factors draining reserve balances, reserve balances with Federal Reserve Banks, weak average, the amount of total reserves has been drained by over $350 billion in just the last month, $354 billion. So the banks are, they do have some. However, the commercial real estate bust is, if it's, as big as I think it could be, it is going to be so big with the cash flow problem because so many real estate investors don't just pay cash for their properties anymore. It's all financed with debt, almost all of it. Most real estate investors, whether they're rental property owners or commercial real estate investors, whether they're Jared Kushner or Donald Trump before he became president, they use lots of debt for building commercial real estate, for commercial real estate investing after it's already built, for getting tenants and cash flow. Real estate for decades now is a very leveraged investment as, uh, investment asset class. So the reserve balances are declining, but the problems here are massive. With the size of the commercial real estate market, I've done shows on it in the last couple of weeks. It's well over $10 trillion, and that's not the only problems. So this new article that came out on, let me pull it up. It was a couple of weeks ago, but it's for the July-August 2020 issue for The Atlantic. It's by Frank Partnoy, P-A-R-T-N-O-Y. The link to the article will be 
below this video in the information and description section. They also have an audio podcast reading of the article. If you want to click on the article and you don't want to read it, you just want to, I don't know, you want to go for a run and you want to click on it and have someone else read it for you, they have that set up for free. But it talks about collateralized loan obligations, CLOs, the bank's exposure to them, and then also how Wells Fargo Bank specifically has been hiding their collateral collateralized loan obligation exposure, how they hid it in their in your report for 2019 that came out, I think, in December. And then also the I think it's called a special investment vehicle. It's very similar to what Enron did and what the Fed is doing now with a special purpose vehicle. It's an off balance sheet entity. And he talks about later in the article how Wells Fargo Bank now has a SIV, a special investment vehicle off balance sheet with over a trillion dollars in toxic garbage. And he's saying how Wells Fargo has really bad commercial real estate mortgage backed securities and collateralized loan obligations and other toxic garbage off balance sheet in that special investment vehicle. So I highly recommend reading that article or at least listening to the audio podcast of the article. Also, there's other banks. These are smaller banks, very similar to the housing bubble that blew up in 2008. These are smaller banks that were making enormous returns for years now off interest income on the higher rated collateralized loan obligations. So these things are very similar to CDOs, collateralized debt obligations, and mortgage-backed securities in the sense that they have tranches set up. So there's like the subprime version of CLOs, which are even wor worse credit quality. They call it covenant light, but it's really just zombie companies that have to refinance and might, need, might not even have any earnings at all. It's all fraudulent EBITDA, and that's how some of that stuff may have been packaged. And then there's ratings agency, agency shenanigans, so we'll see what the Fed decides to do. The, I suspect what will probably happen is the Fed will have to buy this garbage at 100 cents on the dollar. People call it par. Maybe they even have to pay even more than that. Maybe, maybe the banks get to market to model and then the Fed pays whatever the banks say the model is. So it's, not, it's more than just 100 cents on the dollar. Maybe it's whatever the banks say it's worth and then the Fed just, right, just uh, creates the digital dollars and gives them a check. But this is the danger with a fractional digital debt-based currency and a fractional reserve banking system. Look, the entire system currency growth credit is a Ponzi scheme. Okay, credit has to grow. Currency supply has to grow. And then the only reason these banks look solvent is because the Fed is there to bail them out. Now, in the past, the bailouts in past financial crises, uh, prior to 2008, the bailouts were not that nearly as big. So there were still bailouts, there were still problems, there were still currency swaps in past financial crises, but nowhere near the size. And I covered this in an article for my Patreon account contributors. This has to do with derivatives. This has to do with dollar denominated debt outside the United States. And then a, that dollar denominated debt is in, because everything is fully financialized, you have these large banks, you have pension funds now. I, I already did the slide deck for this. This will be out hopefully in the next couple days. I have the slide deck. CalPERS, which is the largest pension fund in the United States, they are turning into a hedge fund. They want to leverage up 20% of their total capital, and they want to start doing risk parity trades, just like Ray Dalio, who blew up, whose hedge fund blew up in uh, February, uh, late February and March, and the other risk parity hedge funds. So now you have pension funds, you have central banks, you have pension funds, you have large banks, you have hedge funds borrowing in repo, borrowing in dollar funding markets, and they all expect to, after they leverage up, heads we win, tails you lose. They make a profit, they get to keep it. If they blow up, the Fed bails them out. This all goes back to derivatives. There is no use in society for that many hundreds of trillions in derivatives. It, it's not useful. Now, it's good for gambling. It's good for a casino, but it's not useful to society. Unbelievable. The the stuff, uh, the, the pension fund, <laughs> the, the pension fund video, it's going to piss a lot of you off, the stuff in there. 
Oh, and the uh, chief investment officer. <laughs> the chief investment Oh, I'll save this for the video. I, I won't say anymore. We got to stick to this topic. Okay, so U.S. bank stocks sink as Fed caps dividends forbid share buybacks and stress tests. Bank stocks surged today ahead of what analyst Mike Mayo called the most high profile stress test, which the stress tests are basically bullshit. Now, the, the financial stability reports the Fed puts out are a little more honest than the stress tests most high profile stress test since the financial crisis thanks to handout uh, thanks to handout on the Volcker rule on swap margin easings and hope for tonight's fed uh, fed release of a data avalanche showing how the top 34 banks would fare in a hypothetical crash including for the first time a pandemic scenario and whether they will be allowed to execute their dividend plans so again i'm going to respectfully disagree i just remembered a point that i wanted to bring up at the beginning of this uh, live stream show, but I'm going to respectfully disagree with George Gammon, respectfully disagree with Lynn Alden. In February, I think it was end of February or early March, the Federal Reserve lowered the reserve requirement ratio or RRR for large US banks down to zero, which means they could basically legally have infinite leverage. Why do they do that? You don't do that with healthy banks. You do that to make the banks look better than they really are. You do that because you're anticipating something else in the coming months or six months or a year blowing up, like corporate bonds or the over-leveraged trades in corporate bonds or leveraged loans or the revolving credit facilities that some of these over-leveraged companies can't pay back or commercial real estate or these commercial real estate mortgage-backed securities or residential real estate. I mean, on and on and on and on and on. So not only did the Fed lower the reserve requirement ratio for the banks down to zero, they also lowered other, uh, excuse me, other leverage ratio requirements to make it more laxed to prop up the banks and make the banks look healthy. Now the banks do have cash, but the banks, this is the problem with fractional reserve lending. Okay, people assume that because there's lots of reserves at the Fed, that the banks are safe. No, the banks have reserves there, but the banks are always, because fractional reserve lending, the banks are always different degrees of insolvent. The Fed has to protect them. That's the way the system is designed. That's the problem with fractional reserve lending. That's the problem with having a central bank like the Fed. It's ridiculous. People have to, you have to study Austrian school economics. Murray Rothbard wrote a book about the history of American banking. I think it's, I think there was a couple books, but I'm just going to briefly talk, brief history lesson here. History of fractional reserve banking before the Fed, Federal Reserve was implemented. There was the free banking era and there was a free market, sort of a free market, I guess, in banks. And there was individual banks in a free market that did fractional reserve banking. So the depositors knew that the bankers were going to take higher risks with loans, and in exchange, they were going to get a higher amount of interest. What happened to most of the banks that did fractional reserve banking? Actually, I think almost all of them, they all went bankrupt. And this is why you have to have, in a fractional reserve banking system, the central bank there. And the bankers know this. So this is moral hazard. They know that they can go into repo. They know that they can go into euro dollar or other dollar funding markets. They know that even though the Fed papered over everything in 2008-9 with tens of trillions and tried to, they know that they can restart the system again and start many trillions again in dollar denominated debt outside and start gambling on derivatives again. And then that's why here we are 12 years later, a lot of the same problems. Nothing was learned. Because the people, whether that's the pension funds, the hedge funds, the large banks, they know that the Fed will have to step in and save the system. And I don't like the system, but the, there's a lot of people in power who like the system, who profit heavily off the system. So fractional reserve banking, according to Murray Rothbard, if you don't want to read about the free banking era, history of American banking, I think it's a cheap book on Mises' website. I think you might be able to get the PDF for free or download the audiobook for a couple dollars. The hist uh, Murray Rothbard said fractional reserve banking, all the banks are different degrees of insolvent. 
the only thing stopping all the banks from collapsing is the Fed and changing the rules. So changing the reserve ratio requirements when the banks get in trouble. Changing um, how the banks had the accounting rules changed in March of 2009 that helped the stock market rally again because the banks didn't have to mark down any, there was, excuse me, no mark to market losses. This is rule, this is what I'm talking about with rules changes. But the whole system is basically a Ponzi scheme. Because when credit doesn't grow, when money supply doesn't grow, when these guys aren't either creating, the people in power are not creating new asset bubbles or reflating old ones or new credit bubbles or reflating old credit bubbles, things get really dicey because they won't allow deflation. Deflation in a debt-based fiat currency system with fractional reserve lending, deflation means large-scale bankruptcies very, very quickly. Which is why I think if, you know, uh, things do start to go bankrupt and bust again, the Fed will want to try to devalue the dollar faster. The Fed's going to have to send out even more currency units probably to paper things over. The Fed is trapped. Now they can take a break. Look at their balance sheet, their official balance sheet. Who knows what the reality is? The Fed's official balance sheet has taken a little break over the last three weeks or so. It hasn't gone up, despite the borrowing at the U.S. Treasury, the mass amounts of borrowing, despite what the Treasury General account is. So the Fed can take a little break here. Or, well, that's the official numbers. Who knows what's really happening there? And this is why we need audits. Ron Paul just wrote a really good op-ed. I will put it below in the information and description section. The Federal Reserve is getting desperate. All the different things they're buying, individual corporate bonds, talking about how we need to audit them again because and and this has been been scrubbed from the internet now use a search engine like google and another and search ron paul audit good luck finding any of the actual information from the one-time partial audit that ron paul actually got john mccain and bernie sanders to agree on okay i went through today i looked it up again I did an entire live stream show on this last year, and I was able to find, I think after like the first, like in the first three or four pages of search, I think I found quite a few articles, but it took some time because I had to change the search terms. But now there was no articles on the one-time partial audit that Ron Paul spent most of his time in Congress fighting for. It's gone. And one of the first few articles that actually comes up is on PolitiFact. That's on the first page of search. And it says Ron Paul's a liar and Ron Paul makes things up about the Federal Reserve and Ron Paul doesn't know what he's talking about with the Fed. Basically that he's a conspiracy theorist. So the, the Google Alphabet team has essentially scrubbed the one-time partial audit that Ron Paul spent almost all of his time in Congress fighting for. Welcome to Dystopia. Okay, uh, let me get more to this. Okay, FT reports, back to this bank article. FT reports, ahead of the results, U.S. policymakers led by Mr. Quarles have, I'm not looking at any super chats right now. I'll do that at the end. I got to make sure I remember these points. So I will take a look at Super Chats at the end. I see comment sections. Some people complain sometimes that you don't look at my Super Chat. I'm not looking at all. I'm looking at different. I have like 10 articles up on my screen. So I'm focusing on that. Please, uh, if you like the content so far, or you like my rants, just uh, tap or smash the like button. As the Financial Times reports ahead of the results use, policymakers led by Sheldon Quarles have gone against the grain in their messaging on dividends, speaking publicly of the importance of continuing payments. European supervisors, by contrast, ordered their banks to halt dis uh, distributions while economies are ravaged by the global pandemic. So far, U.S. banks have only voluntarily suspended share buybacks. So what did the results say? The Fed said in a release that big banks will be required to suspend share buybacks and cap dividend payments at their current level for the third quarter of this year. The the regulator also said that it would only allow dividends to be paid based on a formula tied to a bank's recent earnings. Furthermore, the industry will be subject to ongoing scrutiny. For the first time in a decade-long history of the stress test, banks will have to resubmit their payout plans again later this year. Quote, while I expect banks will continue to manage their capital actions and liquidity risk prudently and in support it 
I have to add here, if the commercial, if the commercial real estate market does what some of these experts like Christopher Whalen are saying, it's not going to be enough, no matter how much the banks save up. And liquidity risk prudently and in support of the real economy, there is material uncertainty about the trajectory for the economic recovery. Again, this is a cash flow problem, and if commercial real estate write downs are massive, it's going to hurt the banks even more. It's going to hurt insurance companies, it's going to hurt Warren Buffett, it's going to hurt Berkshire Hathaway, it's going to hurt a lot of really big players. Okay, in support of the real economy, there is material uncertainty about the trajectory for the economic recovery. Fed Vice Chair Randall Kors said in a statement, as a result, the board is taking action to assess banks' conditions more intensively and to require the largest banks to adopt prudent measures to preserve capital in the coming months. Okay, and it says here, Wells Fargo and Bank of America are the worst hit after hours because people are starting to figure out, they guess who has the two, two of the three largest commercial real estate loan books? Wells Fargo is number one. I think JP Morgan is number two or number three. And I think Bank of America was number three or number four. US Bank Corp is also another. Guess who owns a lot of those shares? Guess who owns a lot of insurance company shares and reinsurance company shares tied to commercial real estate? I would argue that no one has more exposure or is more leveraged to commercial real estate than Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway. Berkshire Hathaway even has a real estate agent firm. I don't know how big it is though and what portion of revenues. But there is locally, there is a commercial, there, excuse me, there is a uh, Berkshire Hathaway real estate agent firm around where I live. So let's hope I'm wrong. Let's hope the commercial real estate bust is not as big, but... The banks are very heavily levered to it, especially Wells Fargo. And HSBC Bank has its own problems because they're connected to real estate in Hong Kong, real estate in mainland China. And HSBC Bank has pissed a lot of powerful entities off. They pissed off the Bank of England. They pissed off the European Central Bank. They pissed off the Chinese government. They pissed off the U.S. government. They pissed off the Department of Justice. Guess who are the only two banks that each have their own episode on Netflix's Dirty Money documentary series? Season one, I think it was episode four, HSBC Bank. Season two, episode one, Wells Fargo Bank. Surprisingly, Deutsche Bank didn't get an episode. Maybe they're waiting until President Trump is out of office. Okay, I have a super chat from Emmanuel Ananda. Thank you for the $5. $4.99, $5. Your on rules. Take care of yourself. Thanks for the work you do. You are very welcome. I appreciate it. I work very hard to provide research information and analysis behind the paywall there that really you can't find anywhere else. And I intentionally undervalue it so it's a good value. So the average Joe or Jane can afford it. And I speak with hedge fund managers and they ask me for my opinion on a good amount of things, different markets. Look, I, I was in pitch meetings years ago telling people about Sandstorm Gold, telling hedge fund managers about Sandstorm Gold. I got laughed at by half a dozen hedge fund managers about Sandstorm Gold. This was like three or four years ago. Oh, well. Super chat from Abbey Road. Thank you for the super chat. Do I think the big oil tickers is it tankers are cheap right now i haven't looked at the oil tankers i was planning on doing a article for that so unfortunately i'm gonna have to hold off on a response to that i have to dig into the data um cuppy who is mr oil tanker trade maybe i should have him on for a podcast interview cuppy harris cooperman but every everyone calls him cuppy i think in ventures and capitalism he is still bullish oil tankers and very few other people are so I would have to look into it more. Um, I did look at the financial statements for one oil tanker company after Q1 earnings, and that was, I think, Scorpio. And I think they had only paid off $30 million in debt. So I was expecting them with more free cash flow and higher lease rates to have paid off more debt. So that is worrisome. But I would have to take a look at other companies to see if they did similar, if their balance sheets and financial statements are similar. 
So I will reserve judgment for that, hopefully for another article in the next couple weeks. A lot of it depends on my health problems, though. I do have very serious health problems. I don't want to go into all the details, but I have some very serious health problems. Okay, this is not a super chat. I'll get to the rest of the super chats. Mark says, will they ever reinstate reserve requirements? I highly doubt it. Well, in the system we have now, with asset prices falling and the cash flow problem, it's going to be very difficult for them to do that. So if there was cash flow and we're out of this global pandemic in a couple years, maybe. But in the environment we're in now, the cash flow pro you can't be a real estate investor without cash flow. Anyone who's a real estate investor knows if you use debt for commercial real estate investments or rental property, you have to have cash flow. And we don't have cash flow. Look at all the bankruptcies. The, there's just more and more. GNC just filed this. GNC General Nutrition Centers just filed this week. They were already closing, I think, hundreds of stores in the last like 12 months or so. And I think they're going to close 5,000 stores. You have uh, the gym company, what, 24-Hour Fitness, they just filed their, a bunch of their stuff. I think they had five tranches. They had five different, um, I don't know, tranches is the right word. They had five different installments of leverage loans, 24-Hour Fitness. So the, the collateralized loan obligations have not blown up yet, but the underlying companies in like the lower tranches are blowing up now. And it's only a matter of time. It's going to go, I think, very, very similarly to what happened with mortgage-backed securities and collateralized debt obligations in 2007 and 8 before the Fed eventually, I guess, paid 100 cents on the dollar and the banks got to mark to model. And then the Fed also gave hedge funds and private equity loans later, low-interest loans, to buy this toxic garbage later. So the Fed just the Fed is changing so many different rules, pulling so many different levers. It's very tough for people to keep up. Again, I highly recommend reading The Looming Bank Collapse by Frank Partnoy. From The Atlantic, their July August 2020 issue, the article will be below the video in the information and description section. He spends a lot of time going through some of the problems, and he helped design before he left to go be uh, to go write financial books and be a law school professor. He helped design in the 1990s some of these collateralized loan obligations and collateralized debt obligations. So he has a pretty good familiarity with it. Even with the reserve requirement ratios, the banks are still unstable. They're still acting like hedge we have way too many entities acting like hedge funds even pension funds are acting like hedge funds now well calpers is going to be the first one with their with the amount of leverage they're going to use up to 20 percent of their total assets so even pension funds are acting like hedge funds now central bankers i covered this are acting like hedge funds they're doing leverage bond and currency trades and then if you're a foreign central banker and you blow up on a trade the fed has your back now, the terms are probably not going to be that good. They're going to want a pound of flesh, or there's going to be concessions from your local politicians, maybe in a trade deal or something. Either resource con concession and mineral rights or a trade deal, more favorable trade deal, something like that. But we have way too many entities borrowing cheap, leveraging up, and then gambling in derivatives or currencies or bonds. Super chat from Thomas. Uh, thank you for the five dollars. Do I have an opinion on Dundee Precious Metals? They used to be safer, didn't they? Pay a dividend and have a couple small mines. I haven't looked at them. And either they funded the mines, or they had a couple mines. I can't remember off. This is a years ago. I looked at them. I, I may. That might be something I would have to do like an entire article on. I'm get. I've gotten a few requests on a couple other companies like EMX Royalty. I haven't looked at them in years. That might be something that I would have to do a Patreon account article on. Where I, where I look more into it. Another super chat from Emmanuel Ananda. 
Danielle DiMartino Booth talked about adjusted EBITDA now being accepted in corporate bond market. Please talk about how this distorts bond market and prevents solvency issues that would otherwise arise endless zombies. Well, this is part of the rules changes. This is they have to change the rules so the leverage loans don't blow up, so the collateralized loans don't blow up. They probably eventually will. This is an attempt to delay. This is an attempt to reduce the amount of blowups and defaults and delay things. That's my opinion. So this is the look, the accounting's been very aggressive for a long time. Most of these companies, most of these companies are using some of them are using their own metrics, which is a red flag. It's always um, the adjust. Okay, so EBITDA or EBITDA, as I call it, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, amortization. I don't rely on it, but when you use adjusted, it's even worse. When you use adjusted EBITDA, it's even worse. But if they're going to change the accounting rules again, it's basically going to be fantasy. This is to fool the high-frequency trading algorithms and retail investors. And any short-term oriented financial professional or institutional investor that has to trade only on the headlines. So we're, we're headlines, we're, our, our um, stock markets and bond markets now are about headlines and fooling the most number of people. Because if it was on fundamentals, you would go and you would ignore the bad accounting, the new metrics, and you'd go focus on the fundamentals. Super chat from Toby Wilson. Thank you for the super chat. I appreciate the $6. Is there another oil one here? Let's see here. I think there was another oil. I'm scrolling. Give me a minute. Okay, Abbey Road has another one asking about going long-term for five years on oil stocks. I haven't looked at a lot of the oil stocks yet. Um, Art Berman, I was going to put out an oil update hopefully in the next couple weeks. So the oil market has rallied more than I expected, and I think a lot of shale oil production is starting to come back online fairly quickly in the next month. And if the U.S. economy starts to roll over and the Chinese economy starts to roll over, the Chinese economy has stockpiled a ton of oil. Ton. I have a uh, really good chart. I'll put that behind the paywall in an article. So we could have a new buying opportunity in oil. There could be, if things get a lot worse with the amount of people infected and the economy slowing down and a commercial real estate bust, those oil stocks could be back on sale again. I would not buy, if you're going to buy oil at these levels, any oil companies, I would not buy, again, I say this with gold companies too, I would not buy all my position at once, in my opinion. So you might want to stick a toe in, I would not buy all my position at once. So we might, we've had a larger rally in oil than I expected. Some of it was short covering. Um, I think there was a derivatives blow up when oil went negative. So it wasn't just the trading software for like some of these brokerage companies, like interactive brokers where they couldn't do negative on their software. And the guy who had like $77,000 trading county ended up owing what, 9 million or something because he was using, using margin. I think there was an oil market derivatives blow up. Uh, from what I heard from a hedge fund contact, it was Bank of China that they had personally for their own account, like a hundred billion dollar derivatives over-the-counter oil derivatives loss. Asheree Moore asks, is Sandstrom Gold still a cheap buy? There's an article update on valuation for Sandstrom Gold behind the Patreon account paywall. Showing what cur current market cap versus my valuation metrics at different gold prices. Okay, ExxonMobil has the most leveraged balance sheet. Uh, BP has very high costs, and it's going to take them at least a year to get their costs down. Royal Dutch Shell is, sa uh, Royal Dutch Shell is the safest of the three. You mentioned there in tickers. And Chevron is safer than ExxonMobil and BP unless they add a lot of debt to their balance sheet. I don't like what ExxonMobil did with debt on their balance sheet, although they did do some asset sales, but they've been doing asset sales to pay their dividend. I don't like what ExxonMobil's doing with their balance sheet for a while now. 
and BP, BP's higher cost. So if oil goes back down, BP, BP should have cut the dividend a while ago. I haven't checked recently to see if they cut the dividend. They should have cut it. When I looked at their financials after they announced uh, Q1 earnings, they definitely should have cut their dividend. I don't know if they've cut it yet, though. I think they're gambling that oil would rally. But if oil goes back down, BP is not cutting their costs fast enough, they should cut their dividend. There's lower cost producers than some of the ones you mentioned, uh, Abbey Road. Lower cost than uh, BP. There's better ones here in the U.S. EOG Resources is one. I may have to write an article on that. And uh, Parsley Energy. I think they're generating free cash flow. I should probably get Dan Steffens on for an interview. He's out of Texas. The one problem with Dan Steffens, he's a really smart guy. He's worked in the oil industry for, I think, 30 years. But he's always bullish oil. He's There's no bearish, there's no scenario where he sees bearish oil prices, oil prices falling. So he's always big invested in oil. He's always expecting higher oil prices. It's not a balanced view with him. Now, he is really good, though, bottom up, picking out good oil company stocks. He's really good at that. But his like macro analysis of supply demand fundamentals for oil is uh, he's been off a lot in the past. So if I do interview him, and I don't get to mention that on the interview and ask him about his oil price prediction record, you should know ahead of time. Almost 500 people now on this live stream show where I rant about the banks and fractional reserve banking and digital debt-based fiat currencies and hopefully not cashless society and government cryptocurrencies which are unfortunately are being accelerated in the not too distant future. I have another slide deck done with a short video for that. Hopefully that'll be out in the next couple days. The Robin Hooders are getting are learning how the market does mean reversion. Over the short term, anyone can get lucky and beat the market. The longer things go, the odds are a novice investor will not be able to beat the market. We'll suffer losses. Super chat from Daniel. He says, don't forget to upvote. Thank you very much, Daniel. I appreciate it. Um, I don't... Anthony, thank you for the super chat. He has Dean Coons Avengers Event 2. I'm not sure what you're talking about. Oh, Agenda 21, new COVID was planned. Uh, nothing surprises me anymore. If you watch Chris Martinson videos, you know that Dr. Fauci spent a lot, millions of dollars each year on gain-of-function research and a bunch of other stuff. Other nefarious things. Okay, I'm checking for Super Chats to see. Oh, I got a couple more. Stephen Crawford, thank you for the Super Chat. What do I think it will take for gold stocks to start to trade at 2011, 2012 valuations? The price of gold is near those highs, yet the stocks aren't. Gold has to be, people have to really believe that gold's either going to be at $2,000 an ounce soon or higher. It's fine because as a royal for me at least, as a royalty and streaming company investor, I own Wheaton Precious Metal shares and Sandstorm Gold shares. Those are the those are the main ones I own. But those companies, if gold price stays capped for a while below eighteen hundred and the stocks don't do very much, you're gonna see more growth. Now you are I was just remembering this part before I wrap up the live stream show. If there's I think in the last six weeks, there's new royalty and streaming companies. You got to be very careful with the new ones. So some of these, some of these new companies are buying royalties from mining companies or private sales, and they are buying stuff that the average retail investor does not know that they're paying more than twice, five x, ten x what it's really worth. And so what they're going to do is they're overpaying for a lot of these assets, these royalties where they might not even be good assets and they're packaging these things together 
and marketing and saying, look, we just bought 40, 30, 40, 50 royalties when, and they overpaid for all of them, sometimes by double, sometimes by a lot more than double. And here's our growth plan. Meanwhile, the company has no cash flow or little cash flow. They maybe they have a royalty on an old mine that has very little to no exploration upside, and that cash flow could run out. So they have very little cash flow. So a lot of these new royalty and streaming companies, they're not going to make it. Now, the shares might go up a lot as a speculative play, like maybe Davey Day Trader and some of these other Robin Hooders will say, oh, that stock's below a dollar, dude. They have all these royalties, even though they have no cash flow. And maybe it goes up a lot if gold prices go to $2,000 an ounce or higher. But fundamentally speaking, from an operational standpoint at the business, the business does has very little prospects for a diversified for a portfolio of diversified cash flow royalties and streams. Also, a lot of these uh, smaller ones, a new entrance, and I have an article for the only good one uh, so far that I've seen in the last uh, six weeks or so, because they actually have five or six royalty. They have a proven management team that's actually built a royalty and streaming company before years ago and then sold it to Sandstorm, Sandstorm Gold years ago. And then they actually have five or six royalties they put together that are actually cash flowing which means then they have some diversification, they have some cash flow, and then they also have some other growth over the next couple of years. So that, to me, looks like an interesting speculation. I haven't bought any shares yet, but you can read the article behind the paywall. But you got to be careful because now all these tiny little junior gold mining CEOs are seeing that the royalty and streaming companies are doing so well, they're raising capital, it's easier to run a royalty and streaming company than a junior gold miner or even a producing mining company because the businesses are capital efficient. They normally, when you have cash flow assets, it's the margins are higher throughout all parts of the cycle. So now you have all these new entrants into royalty and streaming, but the business model does not work very well until you have a portfolio of cash flow assets, which means more than one or two. You have to have at least like a half dozen, probably more than that normally. Although with a smaller company, if you're going to do small, if you have like five or six and you're going to do smaller deals, maybe. It makes sense though, because the larger royalty and streaming companies, it's easier for them and they're raising more capital. It makes sense that there was going to be more, there was going to be uh, new companies trying to copy the model. It's just not as easy as they make it out to be. You have to have the cash flow for the model to work well. Otherwise, it's all share dilution. And the retail investors are not going to know how quality the asset's being bought. And then you might not know what was paid. Because in a, in a lot of these cases, the transactions before the company went public were done all pri were all done privately. So you could have had, a, I've, I've spoken with Nolan Watson about this in the past, you could have had a scenario where there was a package of royalties and they were pretty much all garbage on really bad land packages that have already been drilled off and a tiny little royalty company went and paid you know 40 million 50 million in cash or stock combination after they did a capital raise privately and then they're going to go and use that saying look at our growth profile at a higher gold price some of these royalties are going to hit even though they have no cash flow to go and raise more capital and the management team you have to be careful if they're how much they're going to pay themselves Got a lot of stuff in here about the global pandemic. I would prefer not to talk about that now. I want to focus on investing and the banks. So wrapping things up here. This was predictable about the banks in February and March. Once the Fed lowered the reserve requirement ratios down to zero. And then also in addition to the reserve requirement ratios or RRR, they also relaxed. They uh, relaxed other leverage ratios for the banks. So the Fed anticipated there would be problems with the banks. Meanwhile, over the last four months or so, they've been telling everyone the banks are great. The recent stuff that just came out today, the banks are not so great. If And I think the next shoe to drop has to do with commercial real estate or residential real estate or uh, problems with large corporations with their borrowing, with revolving credit facilities, leverage loans, and then there's the derivatives on top of the commercial real estate 
the commercial real estate mortgage-backed securities too. So it looks like Wells Fargo Bank is in some big, big trouble if you believe a lot of that stuff in that article. Okay, that's it for tonight's live stream show. I want to thank... Let me see here. Did I... I think I got everyone's super chat. Just check one. Oh, one more. Okay. My bad. Wally, $5 super chat. Thank you. So I heard the repo market has been discontinued and the Fed has gone full throttle and just throwing liquidity and buying everything. Is that true? No, there's been some repo spikes. The repo market is used on a daily basis for uh, different things. So it's not just where hedge fund managers want to borrow from money market funds that loan into repo and then leverage up 10x and go do the risk parity or basis trade. It's actually used for different real life functions in the real economy. So it's similar. There are similar purposes to the repo market to the commercial paper market. It's used by, by the real economy. Now the problems again, and this goes back to the long article I wrote for patrons, leverage and derivatives. It's that bad cocktail, that bad combination of borrowing capital leveraging up, putting on a trade in derivatives or currencies or bonds, corporate bonds or government bonds, and then those trades blow up. That's how long-term capital management blew up. That's how other um, like the other crises where banks were betting on bonds that blew up in the past before long-term capital management, all the long-term capital management, the banks started leveraging up even more after that. The, the banks are basically hedge funds at this point. The banks don't even really need depositor money because the Fed, that's just for tax purposes. The banks don't even need depositor money anymore at this point. The, they just call up the Fed and the Fed sends them, the Fed just credits them. The Fed just, it's the magic money tree. The Fed just literally ha, uh, sends a couple clicks. So the banks don't even really need depositors anymore. That's how much of a Ponzi scheme the system is. And I discussed this years ago in interviews with uh, Nomi Prince. She was a managing director at Goldman Sachs and Bear Stearns. The reserves in the system are used as collateral. So the banks can then do a bunch of different hypothecations, rehypothecations, leverage up trades on a bunch on derivatives, currencies, bonds, make loans out of the US. It's a mess. Tom says he would like a magic money tree. I would also like one, but then if it print if it gave me currency units, I would like gold and silver, thank you, and real estate and maybe some oil. No, barrel storing barrels of oil would be too difficult. Uh oil company shares. Nah, I don't think it's a good idea to store oil. Okay, everyone. Well, I want to thank you for listening. Thank you so much to my over a thousand Patreon account contributors. I'm working very, very hard to put out good content behind the paywall there. There's audio podcasts. There's technical analysis charts on a bunch of different things. There is combination articles with charts and fundamental analysis. And then I focus also on global macro articles about things about a very important topics that I think other, I respect a lot of the analysts that I criticize. I just, there's tends to be things that, that I know more about, like the Ron Paul, the one-time partial Ron Paul audit, where certain analysts are saying the Fed can't come in and save the system like that. And I know from speaking with Ron Paul, from interviewing him three or four times, that it actually did happen because Ron Paul saw all the audit documents. So we know the Fed came in and papered everything over in 2008-9, tens of trillions of dollars. I know from a source that was in a high-level IMF meeting where the phrase, this was a recent article where the phrase currency swaps was mentioned hundreds of times in 2014. So my, my thesis there, and again, we can't prove this without an audit of the Fed. My thesis is that the European banks never recovered after 2008-9. And the Fed has had to keep them alive with the ECB's help for over a decade. So the, EC, the European banks, your Deutsche banks and others, have limped along as zombies. They've been zombie banks for longer than my friend Daniel Lacaille has been warning people about zombie companies in the European Union. 
Okay, again, that's it for tonight's show. Thank you very much to my Patreon account, uh, Patreon account contributors, my monthly PayPal contributors. I also take tips if you want in the top six cryptocurrencies. I do hold them. I do not sell the additional cryptocurrencies. I don't. I think they're a nice little hedge there. They're a little optionality for extras. Uh, excuse me, they're optionality. Nice little optionality. I do not have a large percentage of my portfolio in crypto. Focus mostly on physical precious metals and royalty and streaming companies. And then also I'm a value investor. That's where I originally started. I look for value. Although with central bankers flooding everything with currency and credit, finding value now is very, 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 very difficult. Maybe you have a tiny little window before the central bankers and politicians change the rules and try to move the asset prices back up. And unfortunately, in the Ponzi scheme we have now with debt-based fiat currency and credit, it's going to continue until there's a new system. 